Genesis chapter 33, and we're going to look at verse 1. You love the old Bible? We have a, we have a book that's wonderfully, divinely inspired, given to us. God wrote it. It's his love letter to us, and you know, Sister Carrie was right. We spend a lot of time looking at things that we could look more into the Word of God and spend more time working for God. If we would, let's all stand while we read God's Word. Genesis 33, verse 1. This message has been on my heart for more than two weeks, and the Lord just uh, zeroed it in this, to, to yesterday for me. And so you pray. And I want this to be a help to everybody. Nothing brings me greater joy than folks to say the message helped me. Uh, I, want, I want this to be God speaking through me. And so you pray that this will be effectual. The Bible says, And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked and beheld, and behold, Esau came, and with him four hundred men. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids. And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Now you getting that? As he approached Esau, he stopped seven times and bowed himself to the ground. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. He lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are those with thee? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. Then the handmaids came near, they and their children, and bowed themselves. And Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves, and after came Joseph near and Rachel and bowed themselves. He said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? And he said, These are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that that thou hast unto thyself. Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand, for therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God, and thou was pleased with me. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and he took it. Let's pray. Father, we pray, God, that you'd bless the service today like you have already in the preaching hour. We pray, God, that you'd be with me. Give me unction to preach and the things to say, God, that you'd have for me to say that would help the most. And I do pray this morning there's one that's lost and far from you. I pray, God, that you'd speak to their hearts this morning, bring conviction into their life that they might know that they can come and be saved. I pray, God, that you'd help us now. Guide and direct us in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. I want to bring a message on this. Do we have enough? Do we have enough? In this story, a lost man, Esau, he's a type of the flesh, said, I have enough. Isn't it amazing this world thinks they have enough? They think they have enough to sustain them through life. They never think about death. If they'd thought about death, they'd realize that they don't have enough to get them to heaven. And then there's a saved man in here, Jacob. Jacob says, I have enough, and I want to share it with you. Just what Miss Carrie said a few minutes ago. I want to share it with you. I want to give you what God has graciously given me. And so I want to, I want to bring this message on this subject, do we have enough? A poor Christian woman was fasting. When she broke her fast, she had one little piece of bread and some water. And they heard her say, what? All this and Christ too. One man sat down to a meal. It was one sardine and a glass of water. 
And this is what he said in his prayer. Lord, we thank thee that thou hast ransacked the sea and the land to feed me this meal. He had enough. Amen? This world, and as we're traveling through this world, we ought to stop and think just for a little while what we have. Do we have enough? Can I, can I give you something? We have more than the angels have. We have more than the angels have. They desire to look into what we have. Christ came and saved us, amen, and calls us the sons of God. Amen. The angels don't get to be called that. Do we have enough? Think about the little honeybee that lives its life to make honey. Goes by and, uh, and lands on a little dewdrop, takes a drink. Eats off the honeycomb. Never has to worry whether it's going to have enough. And the Bible says he loves us more than them. He loves us more than them. Do we have enough? I'm going to say in this life we have too much. We have too much. We're, we have so much we're not even thankful. And all we want is more and more and more. Amen. We desire more. We desire more gadgets, more things, more things that we don't even use for the Lord. We have enough in just what we have in Jesus Christ. We have enough. So with that thought, let me ask you some questions to, today and let you ponder those in your heart on whether we have enough or not. Do we have enough salvation to get us to heaven? If we've not been saved, the answer is no. If you're depending on your church attendance to get you to heaven, then no, you don't have enough salvation to get you to heaven. If you're depending on your works, on your giving, and on the things that you do and your, your so-called goodness, you don't have enough to get you to heaven. You know, isn't it amazing that people live their life for the devil all their life? They never, they never call on God for anything, and they die, and folks put them in a casket and want to say they're going to heaven. But Jesus said you must be born again. Amen. And if you don't have Jesus, you don't have enough salvation to get you to heaven. The Bible says for all of sin to come short of the glory of God. You don't have enough, you're coming up short. You're coming up lacking. Jesus told that rich young ruler, he said, Thou lackest one thing, me. You're lacking one thing, you're, you're lacking me. You can have all those things, you can do all those things, and yet you'll come up short. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Hey, there's a hell. We don't enjoy preaching about hell. We don't enjoy telling about hell. But Sister Carrie's right. There's going to be a day those faces that we see that God is placing on our heart to go and tell somebody about Jesus. One day if they die where they are, they won't have enough salvation to get them to heaven. And so the only alternative is hell. And if you've not been born again, that's where you'll be going. It's to a place called hell where the Bible says it's a place of torment. It ain't a place of partying. It ain't a place of uh, joining in with your friends. And that ought to grieve the church. If we really believe there's a hell, that ought to grieve us that we don't want folks to go there. Amen. And we ought to be asking the question, do you have enough salvation to get you to heaven? Amen? Do we have enough? How about you, sinner person? Do you... Do you believe you have enough to make it to heaven on what you have right now? Are you willing to die with what you have right now? Do we have enough? Uh, to the person who's been born again, yes. We have enough. John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Thank God I've got enough to get me out of this life into the life that is in Christ Jesus. Everlasting life. 
How, how did I get that enough? I got it when I got saved, when I got born again. You remember when you got saved, Brother Don? You remember when you got saved? You testified a few minutes ago. I remember when I got saved. I can take you to the place unless they tore it down. But I believe I can still take you to the little spot of land that I was on that concrete floor one morning when I got gloriously born again. Amen. Brother Jerry, we ought not to get over that day that we were passed from death into life. There was a moment in my life when I did not have enough to get me to heaven, but I got saved that morning and Jesus came into my life and he gave me enough to get there. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Listen closely to this. Listen. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and we are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. Brother Don, when we got saved, it's the same as he said on the cross. It is finished. It is completed. I have full salvation this morning. Amen. Not lacking anything. I have enough, amen, to get me to heaven. Amen. Enough and to spare that I can go about this world and tell others that Jesus loves you and give you enough to get you to heaven. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Wasn't anything I did. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If I save myself, I can go about saying, Look what I did. Look what I accomplished. But by grace, all I can say is, Look what he did. Amen. He has given me enough to get to heaven. Number two. Number one is, do we have enough salvation to get to heaven? Number two is, do we have enough faith to keep us in the journey? Do we have enough faith to keep us in the journey? Listen, Acts chapter 27. Turn there with me if you would. Acts chapter 27. Look in verse 21. Now the story is that Paul is on a ship. And while he's on the ship, a great storm comes up, a 14-day hurricane comes up, and they're on the ship. Paul has already told them not to continue on the journey, to go ahead to dock, but they do not listen. So look in verse 21 with me. The question is, do you have enough faith to keep you in the journey? Look at verse number 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood. That means he didn't talk for a while. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and uh, not have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. <laughs> he said, listen, it looks bad. It looks bad. Don't it look bad to the sinner?" It looks bad, but he said, I've got good news. Listen to what he said. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given Thee all them that sail with thee, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God. I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Thank God I believe God. I believe just like it says it right here. Amen. It's not my experience. It's not things that I have learned in the past. It's what this book says. I believe God. Don't you believe God? Don't you have faith in God? You ought to listen to them. If you wasn't here Tuesday night, you ought to listen to that message on faith. Amen. God gives us a measure of faith, and we can have that measure of faith to get saved. Amen. I'm glad that we have the memory of faith, and we have the things that faith brings into our life. Thank God I can believe God. I just believe Him this morning. Amen. Do you have enough faith to get you through the journey? Do you have enough faith to keep yourself in His presence? Well, to keep ourselves in the presence of God. Not in the presence of others, but in the presence of God. That brings faith. Donnie's already said it this morning. 
Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We ought to keep ourselves in his word. We ought to keep ourselves in his fellowship. Amen. Amen. Troy Pierce's wife, Diane, ha- had surgery and come through the surgery. He came by and he told me, he said, Preacher, I remember what you told us. He said, I remember that this thing of fellowship is a two-way, a two-way relationship. We read our Bible and we hear from God. We pray and God hears from us. We ought to keep ourselves. Do you have enough faith to keep yourself in fellowship with God? The devil sure does come around and sure does try to harm and hurt us. It sure does try to mess up our day and mess up our life and mess up our testimony. But thank God I can stay in fellowship with him. And as we said this morning, the devil tells you certain things. But thank God the Holy Spirit tells us other things that are true and right. Do we have enough faith to keep in the journey. I don't understand it when folks have something happen to them, they go away from God instead of coming to God. I've said many times, if I had had that going on in my life, I believe I'd be laying down in the presence of God. I met a man one time when I was pastoring up in Sunbright. I met a man and he'd been out of church for a while. He started coming. Me and my wife went to visit him and he said, well, I'm going to tell you what happened. He said, uh, the other day I was coming down the road and a coal truck sideswiped my car. And he said, I told the Lord, Sunday morning I'll be sitting high in your house. And he got back in church because God let him know who's in charge. He said, God told me I could have killed you right there. I could have had you dead right there. But I love you. And I just miss you. And I wanted to get your attention that you'd know, do we have enough faith to make it through the journey? Folks, listen to me. Don't you believe them liars on TV and that's all they are is liars? Everything ain't going to be golden and everything ain't going to be just lovely. This life has trials and tribulations. And Brother Donnie read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 that we are appointed unto affliction. Affliction is going to come in our life. Thank God we have somebody that we have our faith in that goes beyond what the trials and afflictions are. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 8 tells us that the the toils of this life will not be compared to what we're going to see in heaven one day. Do we have enough faith to make it through the journey? Do you believe God? Amen. Do we have enough faith to to keep coming to God's house? Look around you. This place ought to be full. August 31st, August 31st, 2014. Something starts that day, and I bet half of you know what it is. UT football starts. You know what's going to happen on a Sunday night at 7 o'clock? 109,000 people are going to fill Neyland Stadium and not the church. Isn't that a shame that 109,000 people go to Neyland Stadium and we can't get 100 people to come to church? The Bible says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. I just had a person tell me, and I won't say who, but I had a person tell me that God told him not to come to church. I beg to differ. God don't tell you not to come to church. He tells you in his book not to forsake coming to church. Do y'all feel like sometimes that folks don't take church serious enough? They don't, they don't, they don't want to come. I, had a, I preached a funeral a few years ago. And when I got done preaching the funeral, and I'm not saying this to hang any tags on me, but the man come up to me and said, man, that was good. He said, why don't you put a tent up in town and preach down in town? I said, I put a church up over on, in, in Wolf Creek and they won't come there. What's the use of putting a tent? Then I got two things to worry about. Amen? Amen. Folks ought to come to church. Amen. Folks ought to come to Sunday school. Amen. Amen. Not forsaking the assembly. You know what we do at, at 10 o'clock instead of 11? We assemble. Amen. And, and when we assemble, you ought to be there. Do you have enough faith to keep you coming to the house of God? Amen. Might get quiet there, but it's true. 
This blessed old book that I hold in my hand. It's true from beginning to end. Hebrews 10.25 is also true. Do you believe the Bible? Do you believe the Bible? Say amen if you believe the Bible. Hebrews 10.25 is in the Bible. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. As a manner of some is. Even more as we see the day approaching. What day? Jesus is coming. Got enough faith to keep you coming to the house of God. Amen. Do we have enough fruit to present to the Savior? Let me read something to you, and I'd like for you to turn there, if you would, Galatians chapter 5. We often think of fruit as other people that we've won to the Lord, and it certainly is fruit. But there's more fruit than that in the Bible. And Sister Carrie, I hate to keep using her, but she said this in, in her testimony. You know what? You know what fruit is? It's what other people see in us. Okay? It's what other people see in us. Now, the Bible says this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit. Do you have the Holy Spirit living in you? If you've been saved, saved you do. You've got the Holy Spirit living in you. The, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And that's not just loving people. Those who love us, that's love. Amen? The Bible says to love your enemy. The Bible says to love those, even though they don't love you. But if you've got the fruit of the Spirit, you'll have love in your heart. Somebody will be mean to you, Brother Jerry, and you'll think, well, I need to love them more. I, I'm just going to be so good to them, they can't help but like me. Amen? I'm just going to keep on being nice and kind and, and good and I'm loving them. Loving them enough to pray for them and loving them enough to witness to them and loving them enough to show them I have love in my heart. How can I have that love in my heart? Because he loved me first. Somebody loved me. Somebody loves me now. And I love somebody. And I love everybody because he loves me. Joy. Aren't you sad of seeing old poor mouth Christian? Somebody said it looked like a mule eating saw briar. Or a mule eating oatmeal through an eight inch tube. Amen. Long face. The Bible says to have joy in our hearts. It ought to be joy for us to give our testimony. It ought to be a joy for us to sing as the ages roll. It ought to be a joy for us to hear God saves old sinners. Our joy is gone. And the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Peace. Brother Ted, we ought to always want peace. Amen? And sometimes peace means meeting in the middle. Compromise. Not compromise in the Word of God, but compromising in the battle. We don't have to always win. Amen? I'd rather have peace than win. Hey, I've won some battles and sat down and say, now why did I do that? Did you ever do that? I, I've won some battles. I mean I, I mean, I come in and I took over and won the battle, but then I sat down later and said, that wasn't right. I've told this story, but the first church I pastored, we had a, the song leader was one of the best... I mean, he was a good song leader. He was a good one. His wife played the piano. And he told me when, when I took the church, he said, now, I've got to tell you something. He said, my wife is incessantly 15 minutes late. And you, could, you can ask my wife, you could set your clock for 15 after, and that's when they'd get there. I had about enough of that, and I went to him. I said, you're going to have to start getting here on time. Well, you know what happened? I got to lead the singing for six months and worry about a piano player. Because I hurt their feelings. Now, I was right in what I said. Don't, don't think I'm compromised. But I could have said it a little nicer. I could have said, can we, is there something we can do to help you? Is there, can we pray about this? I could have said that a lot different. And the results would have been a lot different. Amen? That's not compromising. That's just trying to make peace. Amen? Don't you want peace? The Bible says to live peaceably among all men. 
We ought to want to have peace in our heart. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Sometimes we're going to have to kill the flesh and mortify the flesh and say, hey, I'd rather have peace. Do we have enough fruit to present to the Lord? Long-suffering, patience. Sometimes we've got to be patient. With hey, kids takes patience. Amen. I had a lot more of that when my kids were growing up. I got a lot less of it with my grandkids. Amen. You ought to be at my house sometime. Grant don't sit around and just don't do anything. He runs through the house ah! all day long. And sometimes my patience gets thin. We ought to have patience with each other. We ought to have patience with new Christians. They're not, they're not as grown up as you are. And they take a little patience. Amen. Amen. What not to just, just uh, blow off everything somebody says. We ought to have a little patience and listen. Answer might still be no, but we ought to listen. Amen? Amen. Fruit of the Spirit. Long-suffering. That's easy preaching, hard living, ain't it? Gentleness. Goodness. Faith. Meekness. You know what meekness is? Power under control. Temperance against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Is anybody getting this? If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. John 15, 1 through 5 says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, and it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a little confused about apple trees and crepe myrtles. Somebody told me one time that if you'll cut those limbs back, that they'll bear more fruit. That just didn't make sense to me. I thought, how can that be? We've got a crepe myrtle in our yard. And, and before the season comes, for that to start putting on blooms, if you'll just hack that thing to pieces, hack, Brother Leroy, we hacked that thing down to a little stump, didn't we? That thing had more blooms on it this year than it ever had. You know why? The blooms come on the new growth. The apples grow on the new limb. The grapes grow on the new vine or the branches. Sometimes we've got to be cut back to bring forth fruit. That's what God's doing. He's trimming us back in areas. He's taking out the dead stuff and putting in the live stuff so that it might bring forth fruit. Mm. That's deeper than we can swim. Amen? Do we have enough fruit to lay before Jesus one day? Fourthly, do we have enough burden to bring others to Christ? I didn't talk to Miss Carrie before I preached this, but that's the truth. Do we have enough burden to bring others to Christ? Let me give you this. I won't read the whole scripture, but in John chapter 1, we find an interesting story. We find that John the Baptist had preached about Jesus. He said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And there was a, a young man there, which was one of the disciples of John, and his name was Andrew. And Andrew got saved. Well, Andrew wasn't satisfied with just him being saved. Amen. He went to his brother Peter and found him, and he got saved. 
And Peter wasn't satisfied with that, and they found Philip, and Philip got saved. And Philip wasn't satisfied with that. He went and got Nathaniel, and we can go all the way up to Paul, and Paul is still not satisfied, and there's others being saved because of Paul's ministry. But in between all those men and Paul was a young man named Stephen. And the Bible says he was full of some things. He was full of faith, and he was full of the Holy Ghost. And he stood before a bunch of Jews that he knew would kill him and called them stiff-necked and told them the truth and preached to them. And they did stone him to death. But while they stoned him, there was a man there named Saul who consented to his stoning. And then Saul, on his way to Damascus one day, met the same Savior that Stephen knew. And God changed his name to Paul. Amen. And Paul got me saved. You say, how did he do that? He went about this world setting up churches. He went about this world pinning down what the Holy Ghost told him and wrote us a Bible. Amen. One day I heard it preached. One day I got saved. And all those, Brother Don, that God saved under my ministry goes back to Paul. They actually go back to Stephen. <laughs> and they go back to Christ. Do we have enough burden to get others to Christ? Sister Carrie's already said it. It just means calling somebody on the phone or going to their house and saying, won't you come with me in the morning? They've got a son named Tommy. He came for a while, and he loved it. He just a a ate it up. And the devil told him, you can't live good enough to go to that church. Told him they couldn't live good enough to go to that church, and so they quit. Don't you think they need to be in church? These two believe that. Do we have enough burden to go tell them? Do we have enough burden to go sit on their doorstep and cry and say, you need the Lord. There's people all throughout this room that have loved ones that's not right with God, not saved or out of church. And it might just take one of us going and saying, if you'll come to church with me, I'll sit with you. If you don't want to sit in the front, I'll sit in the back. I'll sit where you sit. Be my friend today. Come to church might just take one hook in the water and you got them. God's got them. God works through us. We are the conduit to get others to Christ. Amen. Now the devil, the devil will tell you, I just, I wouldn't invite somebody over at that old church. That old preacher's going to preach something that's going to make them mad. Don't, don't get them to come. Folks, we ought to have a burden. Those four men that got one, dropped him through the roof. Whatever they had to do, they got him in the house of God. They got him in the front of Jesus. And he got saved. Last thing, do we have enough joy to keep us singing? Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Did you know the Psalms 58 times uses the word sing? I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. I will sing unto the Lord because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Don't worry, I'm not going to say all 58. Lastly, therefore I, will I give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen and sing praises unto thy name. He keeps me singing. 
He keeps me singing. I'm overwhelmed with joy. Where's our song? Where's our song? Do we have a song that my song will ever be? Praise the Lamb who died for me. And I'll sing it while the ages roll on. I believe that Paul is in heaven right now <laughs> singing praise the Lamb that died for me. Don't you? Don't you have some loved ones that's in heaven right now singing praise the Lamb who died for me? Brother Bill takes every opportunity to stand up and say I just want to praise the Lord Jesus for saving me, the Lamb of God, the blood, all the things that we can praise Him for. We got something to sing about. They don't have to write a new song for us to sing. That new song was put in our hearts when we got saved. Then we're going to sing a new song when we get to heaven. Praise the Lamb who died for me. Let me ask you a question. Do you have enough? Do you have enough? Is there enough there to make us a follower of Christ? Is there enough there? If there's not enough there, there's a place to fill up right here. Christ has put it in us. We're complete in Him. We ought to come to, to this morning and say, Lord, I'm not saved. I don't have enough to get me to heaven. I need Jesus this morning. All the other things I talked about today, all that's found in Christ. All that's found in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. If we'll come this morning, He'll give us enough to make it home. How about you? I'm asking you to come get a song. Everybody stand.